Okay, I think we should start now. Uh, so today I'm going to continue that, uh, continue classification with linear models. Uh, so the last thing we got last time was on logistic regression. Uh, and uh, so the base, we discussed different loss functions like squared error loss function. And uh, then we introduced the activation function of being going through a logistic function. So ensuring that the output of the linear classifier would be, our model would be between zero and one. But then we saw that if we have a squared error, it wouldn't be still suitable. So then we introduced cross-entropy loss, which essentially looks like this. Uh, and we said that, well, this is kind of nice properties that if the model is more confident, then, but, and it is making error, uh, it should be penalized more. The loss should be larger than uh, when it is less confident. And uh, so the behavior of this uh, loss function looks like this for logistic regression that if we are uh, predicting the Z output of the uh, model is predicting a large value and suppose the true class is class positive, so T equal to one, then there would be a very small loss. There is still non-zero loss, but the loss would be zero. But then when the Z is negative side, uh, so minus three, for example, there would be a kind of large uh, loss here. And the trend, the behavior is uh, linear. So, and then we can comp uh, compare some of the losses that we introduced. Uh, so for example, we can have, uh, so we have this zero one loss, which we discussed earlier. It is the ideal loss that we want for binary classification, but the problem with it is that it is not easy to optimize. And then we saw other examples. So for example, least square loss would be this one or logistic activation function, but with least squares uh, loss function. And uh, so I think that was the point that uh, we stopped. So uh, for the rest of today, what I'm going to do is that talk a little bit more about logistic regression for the binary case, and then go on to the multi-class classification, which would be very similar. And then uh, for the next lecture, which we will begin today, uh, we start talking about bias and various de variance decomposition. So if you recall for- uh, uh, Sorry, uh, I have a question. Oh. Uh, yeah, so I wanted to ask, why is the classification task called logistic re regression? Right. Shouldn't it that's, be logistic classification? Yeah, that's 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 a good question. I, I think it's just a historical reason. I know I do, I'm not sure what it's called, why it is called regression, but this is this would be strange name. I, I agree. It is not a regression problem. So logistic regression is for classification, but I don't know what is the historic reason that's it was named like a few decades ago, like this, I like guess almost like a century ago. Almost. But if you wanted to name it today, it would be something else. Okay. Okay, uh, so last time we had, uh, we had also, uh, so we started for the regression part, we started from, uh, kind of squared error and said that that's kind of reasonable and intuitive one, but we also provided a, a probabilistic interpretation uh, for it, which was that if the, our noise model is Gaussian, then doing maximum likelihood estimation would lead to the same uh, to, and doing maximum likelihood estimation leads to the same loss function that we get for a squared error. So here we can do the same thing for logistic regression, but with a different probabilistic model. So the probabilistic model that we have uh, is like this, that we say that uh, we have some input and we have some weight. The probability of uh, the true label being one, so here we have zero and one, the probability of being one is defined with this probabilistic model. So one divided by one minus plus e to the power of minus W transpose X. So that's, uh, that is the probabilistic model. And as you see, if we do that der uh, derivations for maximum likelihood estimation, 
uh, that essentially gives us the same model that we have, uh, the cross entropy loss and uh, what we get in logistic regression. So just let me go through it uh, quickly, uh, but you can check the details later yourself. So this is the probability of class one. The probability of class zero would be one minus probability of class one. Remember, this is binary classification. So if you write it, it would be e to the power of minus something divided by the same denominator. Now consider data set that consists of x1 t1 to xn tn. So this is data sets that we have. And now we want to do maximum likelihood estimation for the weight of this model. So we want to find a weight w that maximizes likelihood. So uh, you recall that the likelihood was probability of data condition on the weight. And we su assuming that the data, the inputs are independent, we can write the probability of uh, data, so T1 to Tn condition on X1 to Xn, and also the weight of that model to be the multiplication of each of these terms. And again, as before, we can do uh, uh, take the logarithm of it, and we get to something like minus and take a negative of it. So instead of maximizing it, we minimize this objective. We get summation over all data points n of log of these terms. Now, what remains to be done is just to compute the log of that probability. And uh, so let's do it. So uh, maximum likelihood estimation would solve this minimum of minus summation of these logs. So I divide the data set to kind of to simplify to those with t equal to zero and those with t equal to one. Uh, and recall that for each of them from here, uh, so this is the probability when it is equal to one, this is the probability when they are equal to zero. So we just plug that. So for summation over all in this, all data points, when t is equal to one, that would be log of one divided by one plus something e to the power of x transpose xi, right? And then uh, we also have the summation over t equal to zero of uh, the probability of t equal to zero. So now recall that for a linear model, and what we did is that uh, we assume that we have a linear model that generates a z, and then it goes through a, a kind of activation function, which was a sigmoid. So the, the, our linear model behavior is like this, that y of x and w is the sigmoid of x and w, and that would be one divided by uh, one plus e to the power of w transpose x. So, and you see that this term essentially, our linear model, these two terms are the same. So I can replace that uh, fraction with just y, and I can do the same thing with uh, the other term, the other terms that have log of e to the power of something, it would be log of one minus y. So I just write uh, this maximum likelihood problem as this minimization of summation of log of y's when t is equal to one and log of one minus y when t is equal to zero for ti's for data sets. Is it clear so far? Um, I have a question. Sure. Is this problem still convex? Because um, now we have logistic activation. Yes, uh, so... that's a good question. Uh, it is, but uh, I haven't shown it. Okay. Yeah, but it is. It can be shown that this problem, logic, if we solve this problem, which would be the same as logistic regression, it turns out that would be a convex optimization. So okay. there is a question. Okay. So there's a question: What the probability is? one divided by one plus. Uh, uh, you... So can you go to the previous slide? Okay. Uh, so uh, on the first set, when t equals to one, the probability is mm -hmm. one over that thing. So why yes. is that? So that's, uh, that's a statistical model that we defined to be that way. 
Uh, but so if you recall in the regression case, we had, we said that the probabilistic model was uh, kind of defined by Gaussian distribution, right? Oh. So here we say that the statistical model or probabilistic model that we have has this form. But if you can kind of uh, convince, so this is just the form of it, but you can convince yourself that this is a valid probability distribution. Like uh, this value would be z between zero and one. So if, oh. if, um, if this term, if W transpose X is very large or very uh, small, like very large positive number or very large negative number, this would be either E to the power of say minus infinity or E to the power of in positive infinity, which would be either, uh, which basically makes the uh, ratio either going between zero to one. Oh, okay. So basically, we assume that there's uh, this kind of distribution that the probability kind of follow that distribution. Yes, exactly. exactly. Okay. So this is our modeling assumption. Mm. Okay, got it. Thanks. Okay, uh, okay so we, we got to this point. So uh, the next step from this step to this is just noticing that we can put all the two summations into one summation because, uh, so what would the summation? It would be ti log of y or y minus ti log of one minus y. And why is this the case? I think I mentioned it last time that t is either zero or one. So depending on which one is uh, the case, only one of these terms would be zero. So either we have zero, one or one, zero. Uh, and that matches with uh, these divisions of uh, data into these two summations. So we get to this loss function. And this loss function is the same as we had for logistic regression a few slides ago. So let me see. Yeah, so I guess this is the loss function we had for logistic regression before. So we get the same loss function when we started from the model, the specific model that we assumed here at the top of this page and pro uh, follow the, uh, the probabilistic, uh, follow the maximum life estimation procedure. So that's another interpretation for probabilistic interpretation of logistic regression. But again, I mean, uh, we don't need to necessarily interpret it as a maximum life estimator if the modeling assumption is not what we had. Okay, so uh, that's, and is there any question here? Let's, uh, so let's go through the, uh, briefly go through the derivations of the gradient descent for, um, this logistic regression. Uh, so previously in the case of re linear regression, we had a direct solution. So we could minimize the cost function by just doing matrix manipulation and have a, if we are able to do matrix inversion, uh, you know, kind of computational toolbox, then we have a direct solution for it. Uh, but uh, for logistic regression, doing this procedure, we can't get a close form solution. So we need to do an iterative approach. And the iterative approach that we had, uh, we have is gradient descent. Uh, so uh, we talked about this, we have gradient descent, it's an iterative procedure, which gradually gets us closer to the global minimum. So we initialize weights to something reasonable, for example, zero, and then we just follow the gra uh, direction of gradients. And if we compute the uh, gradient of logistic regression, you can verify that, uh, that, okay, so this is the loss function, this is the model, so which depends on Z, which is like this. So we want to compute the derivative of this loss function with respect to weights here, right? So we do chain rule, uh, so we compute the loss function with respect to Y, uh, and then we compute the derivative of y with respect to z and the derivative of z with respect to wj, for example, one of the weights. And if you do the calculations, 
you get something like it would be y minus t xj. So xj uh, y what is the prediction of our model? T is the target, and xj is the input, the jth dimension of the input. So this is kind of interesting. It says that if uh, for example, if y is very close to t, for example, assume it is exactly uh, equal to t. So if t is, for example, one, suppose y is equal to one. So uh, then there is no uh, derivative there. So derivative would be zero, which basically means that we don't need to update that weight anymore. Uh, and here, the, also, I guess the other thing is that the weighting of xj basically says that how much the contribution of j dimension of input is to the gradient. So maybe, okay, so maybe I have a question for you. Is it ever possible to have, okay, t can be zero or one, but is it ever possible to y to be one, for example? Or when y can become one? Any answer? When z like, is zero. When, oh, when z is sorry. zero. Yeah, infinity. Um, at infinity, at infinity. infinity. Okay, so that's a good point. If it's infinity, right? Which, what does it mean about the... Uh, so, okay, so z is w transpose x, essentially. Suppose x as inputs are bounded. So what does it mean about W. Weights are very large. Yes, basically, weights should go to be, go to infinity, infinity for that to happen, which is something that we actually don't want, and it's not happening. Like in a finite number of iterations, we can never go to infinity. Uh, so this is kind of, basically says that y can never become infinite cannot never become exactly one or exactly zero. It can be very close to it. It can be 0 0.999, but it won't become one. So this model never becomes, if the weights are bounded, this model never becomes uh, completely certain about the probabilities. Just, uh, yeah. Okay, so this is the uh, gradient for one weight. We can do uh, for weights to gradient descent, it would be updated like this, that wj would be wj minus learning rate times the gradient. So that calculation up there was for one data point. For two multiple data points, we have a summation of all yi's minus ti's times xj for the i data points. And we can also write this in form of gradient. So, if we write it in gradients, it would be like this. And if you compare it with uh, linear regression, we see that the update rule is the same. And uh, yeah, so I guess that's a kind of the main point I want to mention here. Uh, let's talk about uh, multi-class classification, uh, which basically says that instead of having only two classes, like zero and one, or true and false, or positive or negative, we have uh, multiple classes. And uh, when we talked about classification, the first lecture, I think, we, uh, I mentioned that classification means that the prediction output, the target is, has a discrete value, but it doesn't necessarily uh, just two values. So multi-class classification, is the case that we have a discrete value, but with more than two valued numbers. So classes would become zero, one, two, for example. So four classes here. Uh, an example of, uh, for example, multi-class classification would be that if you want to classify or predict that the value of a digit, handwritten digit, what it is. So you can take 10 different values there. Or if you want to classify emails as not just spam or non-spam, but spam, travel, work, personal, different categories. Uh, so this is just kind of uh, examples of 
how multi class classification may look like. So, for example, we can have images of objects, animals, uh, things, and then we want to say, for example, what animal it is. It is more than we have more than two uh, two species. So that's uh, based naturally makes the problem multi class classification. So. As I mentioned, the target forms a discrete, uh, from discrete set one to k, for example, zero to k minus one. Uh, it is convenient sometimes to represent them as a one hot vector or one of k encoding. So one hot vector or one of k encoding basically means that, uh, that uh, we represent the target as a k-dimensional vector. So the target, remember previously it was either zero or one, but here we represent it as a k-dimensional vector. But then uh, if the kth class is the correct class, we put a one at the kth class. And for the rest, we put zero. So for example, for uh, four class classification, that would be class number one, class number two, and so on. So that's called one hot uh, encoding or one of K encoding. Uh, and now when we want to uh, classify, uh, we want to follow similar uh, linear model. Uh, the difference here is that the output dimension, the T is not one dimensional, but it's D dimensional, sorry, K dimensional. So as before we have D dimensional input, but output would be in this one hot encoding would be K dimensional output. So for linear model, uh, we define a weight function, weight matrix, sorry, not weight function, weight matrix to be K by D times matrix. And uh, for the biases, we also have K dimensional vector B. So the uh, classification, the linear prediction in non matrix form can be written as ZK for each of K equal to one, two, to capital K being the summation of a J one to D over each of the dimensions of W K J. So W, so now we have uh, one index for the output dimension, one, in, one index for the inputs times XJ plus the bias for it. Or much nicer, it would be if you write in a vectorized form that we can write Z would be a matrix W times X plus B. So previously matrix, uh, instead of W wasn't a matrix, it was a vector, it was a D dimensional vector. Now it is K by D dimensional vector. So uh, we also want to uh, kind of consider predictions as probabilities uh, so that our model predicts the probability of each of these K classes. So what we want is uh, the output of the model, remember is Y's. And we have now this time, instead of having one Y, we have K Y's. We want Y's to uh, be between zero and one, and also the summation of them to be equal to one. So we want the prediction to be uh, essential power distribution. So in order to make this happen, we can use some uh, activation function with the generalization of uh, logistic activation function that we had before, uh, which is called softmax function. So softmax function is this function that takes uh, Z1 to ZK. So each of them is, each of Z is one real valued number and then computes uh, this. Uh, what is this? Okay, so for yk, and k, remember, is between to capital K, it predicts e to the, computes e to the power of zk divided by summation over k prime of e to the power of zk primes. Okay, so this is, and this is done for each of these k's for capital K different values. So, uh, one model essentially, I just write it, maybe we have Z1 divided by this summation. So this is a vector. Uh, 
divided by that summation is at three divided by that summation. Okay. Now, uh, so it has some properties uh, that are enlisted here, which is, I think it's good to think about it and convince yourself that's, that's the case. So outputs are positive uh, because e to the power of something is always positive, right? And then uh, there's sum to one. Why is that? Like if you want to prove that the summation of, uh, so if you want to prove these things, how do you prove it? Just think about it for um, 20 seconds. Okay, so uh, I guess you can show that by taking summation over Y case. Okay, so there are answers coming. The numerators will be equal to the same sum in the denominator, yes, after summing up, normalizing by sum through all dimensions. So unit vector sum, yes, yes. So that's that makes sense. So essentially, if the sum over this, over K, this is equal to sum over K here. And so we see that we have the same sum of our import numerator denominator. So that value should be equal to one. So that's good. So I guess another thing that is good to know is that if one of the ZKs is much larger than others, what would happen? What happens is that soft max for that dimension, for that K dimension would be close to one and the rest would be close to zero. So just to get an idea, uh, I mean, it is easy to prove, but like suppose you have e to the power of 100 divided by e to the power of 100. So k, suppose k is equal to two, plus e to the power of three, for example. This is e to the power of 100 dominates uh, the denominator. So we have, this will become equal to one. So this is for the case of k equal to two. So that is why, uh, this is called soft max because this behaves almost like arg max. It's soft max of a bunch of numbers finds the one, uh, the value of the, uh, finds the one with highest value. So the output of it, that vector that is output of it would be concentrated closer to the one that is, has the highest value. So this is like arg max with the difference that it's a bit soft. So it is never becomes exactly one, but it becomes like 0 0.95, depending on the ratio of things. Okay. Uh, also, I guess one notation of things is that sometimes the sigma is used to denote the soft max function instead of just writing it as a soft max as a whole. But I think in this class, we don't, we just uh, use that sigma as a logistic function applied elements wise. So this is just a notation, probably others use it differently. Okay, uh, so again, we use uh, multi-class classification for to do multi-class classification, we need to have a loss function. And the loss function that we use is essentially would be extension of cross entropy loss, or it's a cross entropy loss, which is defined as summation of t case log of y case, which can be written, and the whole thing has a negative there, so which can be written in this matrix form, that matrix of t transpose times log of y, and log of y is kind of applied element wise to vector y, as mentioned here. Uh, so this would be our last function uh, for the multi-class classification. It would be very similar to what we had before. So the difference with what we had before was just previously t could only take two values, um, value zero and value one. But here uh, we have k values. And I guess the other difference is that we haven't noted, uh, previously we had only one y and we interpreted y as uh, just probability of class for one, for example. But here probability of we decompose y for two-dimensional case, 
uh, we have the probability of class one and probability of class two. So sum of y1 plus y2 now becomes one. Okay, so uh, why is it e to the power of zk? I think you are referring Uh, why is it e to the power instead of that case? Uh, which slide? What is k prime? Okay, this slide, so let's see. Uh, so why is it e to the power of zk instead of zk? So because zk's are, okay, so because zk's are, uh, Z case can be negative or positive, right? Remember, Z K was this thing. So Z case don't have a probabilistic interpretation. In order to uh, make it have a probabilistic interpretation, we pass it through this softmax function. Uh, now, if even if Z K is negative, you still get a probability. This is somehow like, yeah, I guess this is like some sigmoid function that we used before. And I guess the other question is, what is k prime here? k prime is this thing in the denominator. Uh, I guess it might be a bit busy already. So k prime is this thing. Uh, and this is just a normalizing the, uh, that summation. So that ensuring that the summation becomes one, as I think I showed here. Like if we take summation, the thing we, uh, we have, uh, the whole thing becomes one. And why is it, why, okay, so maybe another interpretation of your question is that why it's k prime and why it's not k, just to differentiate that uh, the index in the denominator is not necessarily, is different from the index used in the denominator. Okay, so multi-class classification, uh, we have a model now, everything, so, Z would be like this. The difference is that W is matrix now. Y is a softmax. And the loss function is the same loss function cross entropy loss that we have. We can do gradient descent updates uh, written for each row of W. And if you do that, we get uh, essentially the same update rule, but just uh, which we have residuals times input. So it's, uh, maybe it's a good exercise to try to verify this, uh, but that would be logistic regression. So this is, again, uh, you can think of a logistic regression or the same concept, but just for multi-class classification, because the activation function is logistic-like. I, I think there was a question here that uh, when k is equal to t two, how is it related to logistic function? So if you figure that out, then you see that there is much similarity with logistic function activation. And yeah, so is there any question about these parts? <laughs> okay, so let's talk about stochastic gradient descent. It is it's one of the things that you need to know. Uh, it is not necessarily related to logistic regression or linear classification. It's a kind of method that we use for optimizing machine learning methods. So you already seen gradient descent. Now this is a stochastic version of it. So, uh, so, so far what we have done was that we have this cost function and we want to optimize it. Uh, which consists of point was loss or loss function for each of i data points. So you see we have summation over n. And then we could compute the, uh, by its gradient. And if we compute its gradient, the gradient of the cost function with respect to weights would become the summation of gradient of each of the loss functions, each of the point wise loss function for data point i, with respect to weight. So this is because of linearity of summation and then we can change the order of derivative and summation. 
So uh, the gradient descent essentially uh, what it does is it just computes uh, these gradients based on all the end data points and then uh, does one step of gradient updates. So computing the gradient requires summation of all the training points and this is called sometimes called batch training. So we go over the, all the batch of data. So, uh, but one issue is that if the data set is very large, like n is not 10 or 100, but in the order of tens of thousands or millions, then this computation would be uh, relatively costly. It would be, the computation cost would be order n essentially, and when n is large, it would be, can be costly. Uh, so now the idea is that instead of just computing the gradient over the whole training set or whole batch, we just set we just focus on a subset of those data points and just focus on maybe even one data point and compute the gradient based on that. And after we do that, we just do gradient update based on one of the samples in one of the data points or a subset of data points instead of all of them. So stochastic gradient descent in kind of the basic form update the parameters based on a single training example. So choose index i uniformly at random. So i, uh, so what, what's the range of i? Just make sure that you're tracking. So i is between... Zero, uh, sorry, one and n, yeah. One and n, yes. So it's number of data points. So we choose one of the data points in our training set randomly, and then we compute the gradients of uh, the last function computed at that data point with respect to W, and then do gradients uh, update. So the cost of each, so this is called stochastic gradient distance. This is the cost is independent of the number of data points. And, uh, this basically uh, allows us to update the weights before even going through all of the data points, even once. But why is this a reasonable idea? So the reason that it is reasonable, yes, so if- I have a question, oh. like what if the data is noisy? Like won't it affect, because we are just, what if we choose a noisy data point to update the weights? And won't it fluctuate the weights a lot? So that's a, uh, let me try to kind of clarify or answer your question better. What do you mean by noisy data points? By noisy, I mean, we don't have the correct label. Okay, so you assume that the label is not correct. So it is incorrect, incorrect label. Uh, because I guess what you said that we, have, we may have a, a, a lot of, fluctuation for weight, it happens even if we don't have an incorrect label. But I think what you're saying is that if you have some bunch of, but uh, some of the few of the data points are incorrectly labeled, then that update would be essentially wrong, right? It's moving in the wrong direction. And uh, that is a possibility, uh, but the effect of it would be essentially, I mean, it becomes more clear, essentially proportional to how many incorrectly labeled data points we have. So if there are more than 50% of, or a good fraction, 50% or even 20% of the whole data points, yes, that will affect our classifier. But it will affect even if you use batch of data points. But I was just thinking when we are like averaging over a batch, when we update the weights using an average of all the weight updates over the batch, Mm -hmm. then uh, it's less, I think, uh, prone to noise. So the effect of noise gets uh, mitigated. Right. Uh, so that's true, that's true, so that's true. But uh, I, so that's true, but even if they are not correctly labeled, if they are correctly labeled, it would be noisy. This gradient would be noisy anyway. But uh, maybe I just mentioned kind of this justification here and it becomes clear what would be the effect of even incorrectly labeled or tar targets. Uh, so the justification that why this great stochastic gradient descent SGD works is that 
uh, it is an unbiased estimate of the last function. So if uh, i's are uniformly sampled over i one to n, and we take the expectation of it, the expectation would be essentially uh, one over n of summation over one to n of each of the loss function, which was exactly this, which is exactly the same as the gradient of the cost function. Uh, so, which we did in the gradient descent. So, in expectation, in average, stochastic gradient descent uh, basically tells us to go in the right direction. So, maybe one example is uh, I try to. So, suppose this is the gradient of. costs, how stochastic gradient descent might look like, uh, would be like these vectors. Some of them might be even wrong or opposite direction, but in average, their direction would be the same as that gradient with respect of the cost function. So this is the kind of the reason uh, the issue with it, however, is that the variance of it can be very high uh, because we only have one sample to estimate a mean. And uh, another issue, I guess, computational issue is that if you only look at one training sample at each time, we cannot exploit the efficient uh, vectorized operations that we have. So if you have a GPU or a kind of library that computes much faster using uh, vector calculations, uh, doing this procedure only using one data point would be slow. So maybe I, uh, maybe I try to answer your question now with this uh, kind of answer or with kind of this new insight that it is un, uh, unbiased. If you have incorrect labels, what will happen is that even this cost function would be bi biased or wrong a little bit. Uh, kind of very in a hand wavy argument. If 20% of labels are incorrect, 20% of contribution of this to the cost function here would be wrong. If we do the same thing to, uh, with stochastic gradient descent, 20% uh, of our directions would be wrong directions. But if we don't move much, like if we don't update weight much, which would be the case if alpha is very small, then the effect of it in average would be the same. But you're right, if we have more data points, uh, kind of average, it would be average out, not uh, for each of the updates that we have. Uh, so, so the the effect of incorrect labels will be average out. But well, it wouldn't be average out, so it wouldn't be canceled because the expectation of uh, no matter how many data points we consider in the batch, like one data point, one random data point, or all of them, uh, in expectation, uh, we will still be in the wrong direction. OK, so it, because we are random. So, so I guess the other comment is, yes, we are relying on the assumption that most of, but we assume that, so here the assumption for analyzing everything is that they, all labels are correct. Uh, if, but if it's not correct, uh, in expectation, it would be the same amount of incorrectness that's going through the batch. So you have a comment, some Majid. Oh, uh, I wanted to ask about uh, the number of times that it would require for the stochastic gradient descent to converge um, compared to if we didn't use a stochastic model. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming that it would take more steps, right? Yes. Uh, so if that is the case, then can we say that there would be an optimal number of picking, let's say a batch of things that we, batch of points that we would be able to pick uh, at each step of the SGD, that um, would also ensure that we would um, be able to converge at a uh, probably like with, with a less with less number of steps, but an optimal number of steps. Right. That's a good question, uh, and people have studied it. So 
what is the best size of batch or mini batch it's called. Uh, here, okay, so maybe just for context here, stochastic the gradient descent would be just one data point, but next slide we see that we can get a mini batch, maybe take 10 data points or 100 data points instead of all data set, but something larger than one. Uh, people have studied it. Uh, it depends on what assumptions we have on the kind of underlying objective that we are minimizing, whether it is, uh, for example, convex function or it is non-convex. I, I believe if it's convex, we have some ideas how well it works. If it is non-convex, I guess the problem is, I don't know if we have a good theory about it at the moment. I mean, there are a lot of studies, but I don't know if it is completely understood or not. I will, I will give a paper that kind of uh, actually argues uh, that why stochastic gradient descent can actually become be better than a gradient descent from statistical perspective and others. Um, let me see, uh, try. And, I think it was paper by Bosquet and Utu, I think. It's called Larger Scale Machine Learning or Optimization Machine Learning. It was, I think, a New Rips 2007 or 8, but I will post it in Soish. So I guess the other thing is that, okay, so there's a comment that can uh, explain why SGD can make significant progress without seeing all of the data. So this is kind of, I didn't say it in a very rigorous way, but it can be shown that the, the intuition is that even if uh, we haven't uh, sampled all of the data points, like suppose just we sampled half of the data points, but even by half of the data points, we updated, uh, a lot, we, we have done a lot of updates on the weights. And because the direction of stochastic gradient descent in average is the correct direction, we've moved in the direction of minimizing that cost function. For, so for example, uh, if you have done half of the data point, we have done N over two of updates on W and most of those, and in average, the update direction was correct. So we got closer to minimum, but in a noisy way, of course, uh, without actually going through all computation of the gradient of loss for all the data points. So that's the reason. Okay, so, uh, so stochastic gradient descent in previous slide, I just said, let's have one sample. But uh, what we, uh, but the problem with it was that it's a variance of this estimate can be very high because this is a variance of only one uh, data point. So it would be a variance of only one of the data points. Uh, so what we can do instead is just choose a, a subset of data points in random again, maybe subset M, which is a subset of one over N, and uh, do gradient computation on, the, on that uh, subset. So this subset is called mini batch. And uh, again, the expectation of this mini batch gradient computed on this mini batch would be the same uh, because it doesn't matter. But if we compute the variance of it, we see that the variance would be decreased. Why? Uh, so variance, our gradients now would be this term. So it would be one over M the average of all those M samples that we uh, sample in the mini batch of all the data points in that mini batch. So the variance of it would be one over M squared, right? So it's a property of variance times summation of variance of each of those data points. So uh, suppose the variance of all data points are the same. Uh, what we get here is that we have m times the variance of one of the data points. So maybe I make it just, I made it once, just emphasizing that it's the variance of one of the data points. And the assumption here is that the variance of all the data points are the same uh, because the data are generated IID. 
so they are essential all data points are statistically the same. So we will have m times the variance of one data point. So we get m times variance of one data point. I did not one here. So overall, we get one over m size of mini batch reduction in the variance. So this is called the high m, the size of mini batch is called hyperparameter. Uh, it's, it's a hyperparameter of your algorithm. It's not called hyperparameter. And uh, essentially, we have to fine tune it uh, in order to make the algorithm work very well. If it's very large, it takes more computation. Uh, if it's too small, then we, the variance would be increased. And also, we may not be able to exploit the vectorization. And the kind of the values that we have would be, reasonable values would be for at least uh, many, many methods. But of course, there is no single recipe for all methods. It would be something order of tens or hundreds, uh, like 30, 32 or 64, maybe by the exponents of binary or 100 or 500, even if your data set might be in the order of thousands or millions. Um, yeah, wheel, wheel size of M also depends on the uh, dimension of data points uh, in, because of computational power and memory needed per epoch. Yeah, so that's, that's true. Yeah. I mean, uh, I guess this happens in say, neural networks that the size of neural network might be, uh, um, size of the input to a neural network might be actually large. So we can't really load a lot of data points on, on GPU. Could you kindly, why the variance remains the same and how we went from M square to I mean M in the denominator. So the reason that the variance of all data points is the same is that we have kind of the assumption that all data points are coming from the same distribution. So they are independently and identically distributed. So we have independence and being identical. So, uh, and why we get M from M squared uh, to M in the denominator. So maybe I write it again. So from this step, maybe I write it, use different color. From this step to this step, so you see that M becomes M squared. This is a property of variance, right? It's a kind of expectation variance of, some random variable x would be expectation of x minus squared. So you see that if we ha I have a say a constant c multiplied here, it would be equal to constant c multiplied here, constant c multiplied here. So we get a c squared coming out. So it would be c squared variance of x. So that's what. Uh, the second step is that because we have a summation, right? So summation would be i equal to one to the size of m. So, and because this, we assume that the data is iid, uh, the variance of each of data points would be the same. Uh, and and we have m of them, right? We have capital m of them, so that would give us essentially m in the numerator, m squared in the denominator, and the whole thing would become one of them. Okay. So if you want to compare the behavior of stochastic, visualize the behavior of batch gradient descent or gradient descent with stochastic one, uh, we might see something like this. So this is the weight space. So, so for example, it's a two dimensional weight space, W1 and W2, and this is the optimal. And these are each of these kind of ellipsoid are uh, the level sets of the last function, cost function. Uh, what we see is that for batch gradient descent, if it gets close to, uh, gradually gets close to the minimum, Assuming the learning rate is not, for example, too large. If, uh, if you recall the previous lecture, 
uh, I showed the cases that if the learning rate is too large, the gradient descent might diverge, but assume it's a reasonable value. But what we have in stochastic, if we compare it with stochastic gradient descent, we have uh, the same general trend of getting closer, but each of the single opt-ins, some of them might actually get us farther from the minimum, some of them might fall closer to the minimum. But in average, uh, in average, it would be uh, getting close to the minimum. Okay, so I guess these are uh, similar behavior. If you have very small learning rate, things would not uh, fluctuate much or would not move much. If they are very large, the fluctuations would become very large. So uh, one typical strategy is that we use a large learning rate in the early, in the training, but then, so we get close to optimum, but gradually decay the learning rate uh, when we get close to the optimum, because close to optimum, we don't want to move very much. We just want to fine tune. But of course, these are heuristics. And, uh, and again, there are theoretical results to that what procedure for what kind of function classes uh, or objectives might lead to what kind of behavior. So, so gradually, so question is a gradually decay, do you mean continuous or discrete learning rate? So it can be both of them. It can be like after say these many iterations updates, uh, we decrease the learning rate by half, maybe every say thousand or 10,000 updates, depending on the model, we make it uh, like, so this is, if this is the update and this is the learning rate, one way is that, okay, so we have set points here and then it is constant and then there's a jump and there's a jump and there's a jump or another way would be kind of we start the same but then gradually go down. There are also some heuristics. Uh, so another question, wouldn't the gradually decay strategy also be helpful to case of gradient descent, the non-stochastic one? Uh, yes, uh, I think for that case, okay. Uh, Let me think, I'm not sure uh, what would be the general result here. It might be. Uh, because in a stochastic case, we need it. If we do, if the learning rate doesn't decay to zero, we keep, uh, we never converge to the optimum point. If the update is, come, is a stochastic. But in the gradient descent, uh, the gradient becomes smaller and smaller and doesn't have that stochasticity. Whether decreasing it would help or not, for general function classes, I'm not sure. Um, but what I should say is that adaptive learning rates, the learning rate that depends on where you are in the uh, stage of optimization can be helpful. Uh, I mean, this is kind of beyond what I want to talk about optimization here, but so for example, in the, so gradient descent is just basic first order optimization method, but uh, it would be, for example, better if we tune the learning rate based on where we are at the, the, in optimization. For example, one specific way is to just tune it. We have a direction of gradient, so, yeah, this, this may take a long time. Uh, maybe, okay, so I just mentioned that we have steepest descent, which adjusts the gradient, the size of learning rate based on where we are and optimize it. And that would perform better than gradient descent, but uh, usually it would be more costly. So in machine learning, we don't less use it less as of, we don't use it as often as say stochastic gradient descent or gradient descent, but in some other optimization problem, it might be worth doing it. Okay, so is it necessary to change the learning rates if we change the batch size? 
For example, for higher value of batch size, should we increase the learning rate? So that optimal learning rate, so learning rates, remember, is a hyperparameter, batch size is a hyperparameter, and hyperparameters can affect each other. So what is the best learning rate for this given batch size? Uh, that depends on the size of batch size, for example. So it, uh, usually, I guess, if the batch size is smaller, the model is noisy, the gradient estimate that you get is noisier. So you want to do a smaller move in that direction because you're kind of less confident in the, the correctness of that uh, direction. If the batch size is very large, you can also have a larger learning rate. <clears throat> okay, so uh, maybe what I mentioned here is that stochastic gradient descent and non-convex optimization. So, so far our cost functions have been convex, uh, but uh, one benefit of gradient, stochastic gradient descent is that sometimes it may allow us to uh, get, uh, get outside, out of a local minimum because of the noise in the stochastic gradient descent. So for example, maybe we start from this point we go to another point, but because of noise and stochastic gradient descent, we go to an objective value that is higher, but then the next update would uh, jump us to a region that is uh, in a different attractor of the, this objective. So we are in, now we are in a better uh, region. And now uh, our gradient descent can now converge to local mean. Generally analyzing these things and saying kind of concrete things about non-convex optimization is difficult uh, and is a kind of topic of active research. So this is just intuition of why stochastic gradient descent can sometimes have this ben additional benefit that if your model is uh, non-convex, your objective is non-convex, non which is the case, for example, for neural networks, which we will talk later, uh, we can, uh, it can perform better than a gradient descent, which cannot escape the uh, local minima. Okay, so, yeah, so that's true. You may also jump from global minimum to local minimum. Too. So that's why it is, uh, this is a simplified picture. It is not this, the whole truth. So what is the exact behavior of stochastic gradient descent for non-convex loss function is kind of topic of active research, so. Okay, so uh, let's wrap up this, uh, this long lecture on regression and classification with linear model. So here uh, we had uh, a more modular approach to machine learning. So we chose a model we chose a loss function and chose an optimization, uh, formulate an optimization problem and then solve the minimization problem. So, and depending on choice of the model, which was uh, and choice of loss function and choice of optimization algorithm, we get that many different type of algorithms. Uh, here in this, in this lecture, we focus on a model that was linear model, but also I talked about uh, how we can kind of in, in, increase the power or flexibility of linear model and make them nonlinear in uh, as a function of the inputs by using the basis expansion or uh, feature mapping. Again, still the model is linear in weights, but it is not linear in input. So that makes it much more powerful. Uh, and we talked about different loss functions. Yeah, okay, so I guess I have this here. So. Uh, we talked about uh, different loss functions, loss functions for regression. Uh, we talked about, we had uh, squared error loss. Uh, for classification, we had zero, uh, one loss, but it's difficult to work with. So we talked about some sorbate loss function and we kind of talked about and kind of studied a few of them and their behavior. And we end up getting to the point that we have cross entropy loss function which leads to computational feasible solution with nice behavior, uh, but there is no direct solution. So we have to use gradient descent. Uh, so both of these methods, so both for regression and classification, 
we had this probabilistic interpretation as a maximum likelihood distinction with Gaussian noise model for regression and for some other model uh, for the classification case for the logistic regression. I also talked about gradient descent, stochastic gradient descent. Maybe one thing, okay, so one thing that uh, is also important is the concept of regularization that I talked mostly in the context of regression, but you can do essentially the same regularizer for classification. Like you can add an L2 regularizer or L1 regularizer to your uh, logistic regression. So, um, in yes so i guess there is a okay so that's good so there is a question is uh, that when we talked about classification we didn't talk about the direct solution is that because the direct uh, solution is very costly uh, so we have to use the gradient descent the reason was that we don't have a nice direct solution for it so in Regression, when we computed set the gradient equal to zero, we could convert to a linear algebraic problem, which was involved, uh, which involved some uh, matrix inversion, but that's all. Uh, and that's assumed that's a direct solution, but we don't have that for, if we do the set the gradient equal to zero, we don't get anything that becomes like a nice linear algebraic problem to solve. That's why, uh, so it's not just costly, it is, we don't have a nice, analytic solution. 